in the age of social, 15 minutes of fame can last for 15 years, which is really interesting. So I would argue that the half-life of fame today is increased. So if you have your viral moment, if you have a, a Ken Bone moment, right? Like the red sweater guy from the undecided voter, right? Once you kind of blow up, you are there. So for Cameo, it's not just all the people that are famous now or the, all the famous that will be famous. It's all the people who have ever been famous who can be in that subset of people that can be on the platform. And that is where I think Cameo can start going, where you have these folks that maybe they start a little less famous, but they start building their product market fit and their boot. And then they get a new, like ideally for you, is like you have some like lower list celebrities get booked on a big hit show, booked on a big hit movie, grow their career, and Cameo can ride that wave with them. Welcome back to Yang Speaks. It's Thursday, and you know what that means. It means your co-host, Zach Grauman, is hosting the next episode of The Future Of. And today's episode is on the future of celebrity. And we've got someone I've known for a while whose career I've been able to admire from a distance and finally got him to come on the podcast. Stephen Galanis, founder and CEO of Cameo, is joining and we talk about so if those of you not use cameo it's pretty cool it's a way for anyone to find a celebrity an athlete an actor superstar musician you name it to get these individuals these people you love to send short videos to other people you love so you can send a video of stanley from the office giving a shout out to your best friend it's a pretty uh Amazing tool, they're growing like a weed, just got valued at a billion dollars. Like this company is really, really fascinating and redefining how we interact with, frankly, famous people and redefining that relationship between talent and fans. So thought it was compelling and worthy to have him on the podcast. So we talk about not only his journey as being an entrepreneur, but where this is going and how this is going to affect how we consume all sorts of media in the years to come. So you're not gonna wanna miss this. Steven Galanis, founder of Cameo, joins Yang Speaks, the future of celebrity, starting right now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to welcome world-class entrepreneur, actually world-class. We used to just say entrepreneur, now we can say world-class. World-class entrepreneur, co-founder and CEO of Cameo, Stephen Galanis. Mr. Galanis, welcome to Yang Speaks, the future of. How you doing, man? Thanks for having me, Zach. <laughs> I'm glad we snagged you, man. We, uh, you've just been doing a, a big PR tour. Um, Cameo was just value, uh, valued at a billion dollars. So this, this thing started from let's call it a, a figment of, of your imagination into something that's employing hundreds of people. So let me say this, just it's an awkward, weird question, but now you, you're worth a lot of money on paper, as is your company. What's, how you, what's the, like the, the emotional feeling right now that you have and, and your team's having? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, first off, Zach, uh, again, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, as an entrepreneur starting a tech company, kind of the ultimate dream that people have at the beginning is, you know, to build a billion dollar company, right? To build a unicorn. Um, you know, everybody, it, it takes just as much work to build uh, a company like that. Uh, that's worth zero as, as, as a billion in, in some <laughs> ways. Um, you know, like for every entrepreneur out there, right? Whether you um, are promoting parties like I did in college, or you have a t-shirt business, or you have a small uh, hot dog stand like in New York City, uh, you're working just as hard. So it's it's really about finding a business model that 
can continue to compound um, and, and not just have your efforts be, you know, the thing that's driving it forward, but like, you know, finding network effect, which can mean that the more people that are working on your dream, the more people that are entering in our case, this marketplace, you know, it can just compound in a really big way. And that's what's happened. Um, the thing that's really interesting, and, and I've been reflecting on this, you know, since the announcement came out, while uh, building a billion dollar company is certainly like a dream of every entrepreneur, I would actually use the analogy that it's really similar to being the number one overall draft pick in the NFL draft, <laughs> right? So every kid that picks up a football dreams that one day Roger Goodell will hold their jersey up and they're going to get to take a picture. But, you know, only 2% of number one draft picks make the Hall of Fame. Right. And 50 percent of NFL draft picks, uh, you know, don't last in the in the NFL for over five years. So the journey is very much like while we've achieved like a step on it, you know, at Cameo, we're trying to build a Hall of Fame company. We're trying to build something that's enduring that 100 years from now could be in the Smithsonian if they have uh, an exhibit on like tech companies that came out. So I still believe we're probably in the top of the second inning for what we're doing here. And um, this was just one necessary milestone towards, you know, really building a truly enduring company. Uh, spoken like a true, frankly, leader, which I know you are, um, and I agree with you. I've, I, look, I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears building a nonprofit, which I'm really proud of and has done great, but nowhere near a, you know that type of valuation. So I agree with you. There's, there's, it's not just the effort; it's the execution and the idea and the, and the, the community building or inspiration around it. So let's let me back up a bit. So um, for those of you listening, guys, I knew Steve in college, and um, his nickname was um, Mr. Mayor, which I think you even had in high school a little bit. Um, and it, I don't know how to explain it, guys. Like, so we went we went to Duke University in in Durham, North Carolina, and it's a it's not it's six thousand undergrad is like ten thousand with with grad school kids. So it's relatively big, um, but everybody knew Glanis, and it was because of these random, he was always doing a different venture. And the big one was uh, throwing parties in college. It was Spartan Entertainment. And he was known for Wednesday night, Shooter's Night, which Shooter's is a famous bar at Duke. It's like a Western themed bar and it's a piece of crap. Um, but Wednesdays, nothing was going on. And Steven's like, well, look, if I can get people to show up on Wednesday and they pay five bucks at the door, can I get a cut? That sort of thing. And I'm pretty sure that's how it started. So talk to me about... Um, your entrepreneurial journey, because to me, I always like to consider myself a natural builder, but nowhere near, it seems like it was in your DNA, probably even younger than college, I imagine. So tell us about you and your background a bit. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny thinking back to the Spartan Entertainment days, but you know, in, in many ways, when people ask me what you know I majored in at Duke, like I say, entrepreneurship. We didn't have a major for business or entrepreneurship there, but that's what I did. You know, that that that's what I spend my time doing. And you know, for those that uh, didn't go to Duke between uh, 2006 and 2010, uh, this was a really interesting age where Facebook was brand new. Um, you know, Zach and I were the first grade of college students that actually had Facebook for throughout the entire D of our college experience. And back then you had to have the .edu address to even uh, get onto the network. So I remember, uh, you know, when I was a senior in high school, people would like apply early to a safety school and put the deposit down just to get the .edu address <laughs> so they could join the Facebook at the time. It and, was um, that pretentious and exclusive. <laughs> it was a big freaking deal. And um, one of the things that, you know, we noticed that was really different for, uh, for people like Zach and I versus any other generation that had ever gone to college was that we had this thing, Facebook, and we were connected with every single person that we met. And in many ways, like we're still connected, right? Like, you know, all those people you friended from your freshman to your dorm on Facebook, you know, they've been following everything that you've been doing with your charity, with, you know, with the Yang campaign. Um, so in many ways, like we had this built-in distribution network and we kind of came along at the right time. 
Uh, back then, bar owners were not able to be on Facebook. So back in the day when you know you created a Facebook group and people joined and you created an event and people showed up, uh, me and a guy named Zach Maritas, who's another uh, entrepreneur who was a senior when I was a freshman uh, and is now the CEO of a very successful tech startup back in Durham called Teamworks, Zach and I uh, had the idea to start throwing non-affiliated parties because while well, Zach and I were friends, we were in different fraternities. So if Sigma Nu was throwing a party, the Delta Sigs wouldn't show up. If the ATOs were throwing a party, the SAEs wouldn't come. But Zach and I decided to create our own branded parties that were unaffiliated. And slowly but surely, everybody started coming. So it didn't matter what fraternity you were in. It didn't matter if you were in a fraternity. It didn't matter if you were in band or a football player. Like you came to, to our parties and um, and over a four year period, we took uh, starting with one event, which was uh, putting beer pong tables out uh, on Wednesday night at like the big bar on campus that used to be closed and offering three dollar pitchers and taking the cover charge. Um, we ended up having over 17,000 college students in this Facebook group and started a variety of businesses uh, off this key asset. So we had a college boxes business for a couple of years. We had a hot dog stand at one point. Uh, we did DJ equipment and t-shirt rentals and venue bookings, like you name it, Zach and I were doing it. And I think it really gave us uh, our first taste of entrepreneurship. And for Zach, you know, that capital from Spartan Entertainment was a lot of the seed money that started his business. And he's continued to do that uh, today. And like I said, it's a very successful business. And for me, uh, this you know taste of entrepreneurship was something that I could never fully get out of my mouth. And when I ended up leaving Durham and uh, going to be a trader for a few years and working at LinkedIn, like I did other cool things, but that entrepreneurial bug kept you know, kept nagging at me. And uh, I really believe that like the 3% of people on earth who have that mutation in their brain that makes them like a true entrepreneur, uh, it's almost impossible for those people to to do great, like the best work of their lives if they're working for someone someone else. And I would put myself in that case. And, And for me, you know, Cameo has been something that's really at that Ikigai point for me. Ikigai is this Japanese philosophy that believes that your true life's calling is the intersection of what do you love to do? What are you great at? What does the world need? And what can you ultimately get paid for? And it has to be at that like pure intersection point. And, you know, Zach, I'll ask you, uh, you know, you've known me for a long time. Like, is this bit, is, is the fact that I started this business surprising to you? Oh, dude, not not at all. Um, you've got these smartest minds in the world in, in many ways at Duke University, and they're all like slaving away at their econ exams and their chemistry exams. This thing. And you're out there throwing parties, which seems like a joke. Um, but on the other hand, you're learning 10 times more like because like you're negotiating deals and you're going to contracts and booking venues and recruiting people and developing a marketing plan and like, raising capital and like investing in new businesses. I figured, I knew like Spartan Entertainment was like the tip of the iceberg for you, but I was more surprised when you went, I think you were a trader and you worked at LinkedIn. I was like, I, I knew that wasn't the end game either. So that was, so like, um, but I remember getting an email from you. It was a survey monkey survey. I'm like, hey, we've got this idea where famous people can get paid to FaceTime their fans what do you think of these names? And it was like this long survey of a bunch of names. Uh, Cameo was one of them, if I recall, but there were a bunch of others. Um, nothing personal. Cameo wasn't my top vote. Uh, I don't remember what, my, what it was. I should probably look well, that up. But It's, fu- it's funny. <laughs> so we were just talking about this survey and um, Cameo wasn't on the original list, actually. There were four. There, there were four, and I will tell, this is exclusive. Nobody else has ever heard this story, so I hope your listeners enjoy. Uh, we, we hired a branding firm in Miami called Vanilla Shake, who's incredibly talented, and we went through the exhaustive process of like naming. And in, in a consumer internet business, like a name is so critical. And 
when we first started the business, we we didn't know what the name was. So we were using, um, well, <laughs> so there are two things that happened. Number one, my co-founder, Martin, uh, his family businesses in the UK are all barren, like barren homes and barren finance and things like that. So he wanted to call the business Barren App. And, there, and, and actually today, that is the legal name of the company. The legal name of the company <laughs> is Baron App Inc. Something Please tell that, me when you guys go public, the New York City Stock Exchange listing is kind of Baron App <laughs> so, LLC. So, and, and it's funny because we had actually never, um, it, it, we had never, nobody's ever like called us Baron App before, but in the Wall Street Journal, like funding announcement, they always use the legal name of the business. So it was, <laughs> Talking about Baron App Inc. valued at a billion dollars, the parent company of Cameo. Yeah. So it was just kind of interesting, and and but we knew Baron App could not be like what we called this business. Um, at the time, we decided to use a code name, and we called it uh, Power Move. So power, it was called po- Project Power Move. Was 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 basically what we called it. And the branding firm that we hired came up with three names. Uh, first was hero hub uh so almost like it was like a hub to to find your heroes the second name was thrillo and the third name was hyped h-y-p-d you can tell a bunch of dudes are making this this company and we, we, we put we put this name out these four names out to all of our uh followers on linkedin we collectively downloaded all of our LinkedIn contacts and put the survey monkey out. And unfortunately, Power Move won. <laughs> so we knew we didn't have a great name. And some of the feedback, the branding firm personally had recommended Hero Hub. And for our East Coasters, everyone felt that that sounded like a, a sandwich shop, which was, you know, kind of funny. Uh, so ultimately, we, you know, went back to the drawing board and my little brother, who was working for us at the time was like, I think it should be called Cameo. He's like, these people are kind of making a cameo in your life. And wow. immediately it was like, yes, you little bro. That has to be the name. Of course, cameo.com was not available and seemed to be impossible to get. Uh, all the social handles weren't available. So what we decided to do is we bought bookcameo.com yeah, throw a verb made, in front of it. Yeah. and made all of the socials book cameo for a while. But for the first couple of years of the business, really, people just thought it was called book cameo. So that's so that's a, a, a little you know fun story about how cameo got its name. I've now become very passionate about this and always kind of have been, but Andrew is very, very passionate about naming things. Um, and I, we always joke that like we should write a book or a medium post on how to name stuff. Um, now, Andrew loves naming things, but he's terrible at it. And I'll tell him that to his face. But his big thing is like, when you're doing a new project, something exciting, give it a cool name. So he's always like Project Excelsior or something exciting. And if it's a bad project name, he hates it. So he's like, yeah, I have a good one. But then the second one for me on naming is always the way to name something is to think about how you want others to talk about it and that is how you give it life so it's like the reason hero hub is less exciting because people talking about it they're gonna think if it's a sandwich or like what the hell is that but cameo sounds cool it is interesting it's like for us we named the yang gang like i was like i was really adamant it seems like we need a name for supporters uh the the community building that you guys did was absolutely fantastic you know what you're seeing on twitter with the blue hats right like this is this is really, really uh, next level stuff on community building. And we've tried to do the same with uh, our concept of the Cameo Famio. And the Cameo Famio for us is not just all the people that work at the company, but it is in the same way the Yang Gang, it's all of the supporters, right? So it's all of our customers, it's every talent on the platform. It's everyone that's ever seen a cameo. It's everyone that thinks it's a cool idea. Uh, yesterday, uh, I got a text, uh, a friend of mine who had came and seen me recently uh, was wearing a cameo sweatshirt in the middle of Times Square yesterday. And someone just yelled across the street, I fucking love cameo, <laughs> right? Like, and it's like some random person in Times that's Square. That's amazing. And, and that's, you know, again, that is the stuff that, um, that that community can do. And I think when you have a community that is as passionate as the one that you guys have built or is as passionate as the Cameo Famio that we're building, it actually just 
enhances the organic conversation around you know, your main messages. You have net promoters that are out. You know, I don't know what the NPS of the Yang Gang is, but I'm I'm sure it's pretty high. At Cameo, our net promoter score of our customer base is in the high 70s, right? It's up there with the iPhone or Tesla. And you watch, you watch when you have a, a consumer brand that people are so passionate about, it makes it outsized. It gives us an outsized amount of media attention. It gives us an outsized amount of the conversation that's happening on social. And it just projects this aura around the brand or the candidate or the message that you're doing that amplifies it naturally. So um, I think naming is critically important as Andrew does. And I think activation of community is like the biggest superpower on earth. And this is why when you're watching what's happening uh, with the influencer world right now or the larger creator economy. Um, you know, I saw yesterday Kim Kardashian uh, finally became a billionaire. And one of the interesting lines in the story, right, was that they asked her who's the next, you know, Kardashian that's going to be a billionaire. And basically she said, we all are going to be, right? Like, because we've all built this following and we all, uh, you know, have, you know, have this huge movement of supporters behind us. So, you know, you can give us a product and we can put it out there and we have equity in that product and, and it sells itself because we have yeah. distribution. With Spartan Entertainment, we did the same thing. So I really learned about kind of branding there. This, you know, it wasn't Steven's party. It wasn't Zach's party. We created, you know, this whole aura around Spartan Entertainment and we started creating different businesses and everything was branded really well. So for me, that lesson started in college. For us, we did what we could to apply it to politics. Um, and some people in politics do it really well. Bernie did it really well. Trump does it exceptionally well. Yang does it really well. Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for it, but it's this concept of authenticity and connection and making people people feel far to something. But companies are doing it too. I think you guys do a great, Peloton's one of my favorites because one, there's that authenticity connection between the instructor and you and you're struggling, you're, 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 you're working out together and sweating and gritting. But also, you know, they have a, when they do it, they have an in-person conference every year and people are best friends through this community. All right, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you've heard us rave about our Helix mattresses because they're awesome. So Helix Mattress has left the bedroom and started making sofas and they started a company called Allform and they're making freaking fantastic sofas. I have one in my apartment. It's light gray, it's three seats wide, it's got a little foot thingy and it's freaking amazing. What makes this thing so freaking cool? It is so easy to customize a sofa without like compromising quality, right? So you can pick your fabric, you can pick your color, you pick the color of the legs, your size, whether you want the massive sectional, you want the little ottoman, little leg thingy, you can do it all. They've got armchairs and love seats all the way to eight seat sectional, so it's massive, and they're delivered to your home like the mattress, and you can assemble it yourself. I'm an idiot and I assembled my couch and it feels like it's built like a rock. You get 100 days to decide whether or not you want to keep it, which is more than three months. And if you don't love it, they pick it up for free and give you full refund. So here's the deal. Find your perfect sofa. Check out allform.com slash yang. And allform right now is offering 20% off all orders for our listeners at allform.com slash yang. So check it out. We love allform. For those of us like never use Cameo, I, I know you talk about this all the time, but talk to me a bit how it works, just high level. And then I have a bunch of like nitty gritty questions, um, but let's, I'll, I'd rather have you explain it than me, if you will. Sure, so Cameo is a marketplace where you can book personalized video messages from over 40,000 of the most exciting names in pop culture, athletes, actors, entertainment, entertainers, musicians of all kind. Um, you go to our website, cameo.com, or you can download our app on, uh, on Apple or Android. You can browse through the talent 
Um, every talent sets their own price. So today, people range from zero dollars to ten thousand um, dollars. The average video is about seventy, so it's a lot more accessible than you know most people would think. Uh, when you find someone you like, you can craft a two hundred fifty character message. You click submit. The talent then has. Uh, seven days to basically take your script and turn it into a bespoke, you know, one of a kind piece of content uh, that you're either giving to somebody else or you're having for yourself. And then they, you can save it though on your, if you get it in your app, you can save it and then share it with your friends or keep it forever, that kind of thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. The, the idea that really gave birth to Cameo was that the selfie was the new autograph. If that is true, right? When, when Yang shows up at some event everybody, all the supporters want to end and take a picture with him and then they want to put that on social and it's kind of proof that that happened in a world where you can't be with him at that time, right? Uh, This is a way to take a selfie removing location as a variable, right? So by having a video message that's bespoke, that's saying what you, you want them to say and then you post that on your Instagram or you posting it on your Twitter, it allows you to have that similar selfie experience without meeting the person in real life. And that ultimately enables talent of all types to impact way more of their fans because they're not limited by location as a variable. I pay 150 bucks, 300 bucks, Fifty dollars, whatever that math is, and then you guys get a cut, and then the artist gets like eighty percent. You get twenty, that kind of thing. Yeah, we take twenty five percent of every transaction, and the talent makes takes seventy five percent, and they all set their own price. So um, that's and, and at this point, the thing that's pretty cool about the platform is. In the same way, when somebody's in New York City looking for real estate, they're going on Zillow and they're browsing, you know, within a building. Hey, here's the two bedroom, two bath. Uh, this one is a higher floor. It's got a nicer view. It's got a different kitchen. People are going to Cameo and they're ser- and they're searching people on relative value as well. So if you love the New York Knicks uh, or you love the Rangers, you can go look at all these people and they all have their different price and especially for athletes, like a lot of times, you know, someone like Brett Favre might just, he was number four his whole career. So he'll put a couple zeros behind it and be $400. But, you know, then you might see somebody like it, for the Chicago Bears, this is a great example. Uh, Brian Urlacher and Lance Briggs were relatively similar players for the Bears, like both uh, all pro linebackers. Urlacher, first ballot Hall of Famer, Lance Briggs, maybe Hall of Fame, maybe not. But like for Bears fans, they're seen as like, pretty much uh, equal. Lance Briggs is $55, his jersey number, and Brian Urlacher is $540, his jersey number. So oftentimes, you know, if you love Brian Urlacher, you're going to pay up. But like, if you just want a bare linebacking legend to talk to you, like Lance Briggs is totally fine. Our trust in institutions is declining massively. And I think it's a combination of things. We're an older country, so our institutions, our institutions have objectively failed in almost every uh, area. You go from education to healthcare. Blah, 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 in 20, 2020, just if anybody doubted that, yeah. tw- tw- yes. 2020, just Didn't whether help. it was health <laughs> healthcare or education, trust in or government, government like- <laughs> or, you know, voting or like whatever yeah. it is, right? Like every single sacred institution, uh, religion, right, just came under massive question this past year, right? And uh, and this is actually like tees up really well, kind of like our long-term vision. The technology we're building at Cameo thinks about that, right? Like in a world of fake news or a world of deep fakes, right? Like authenticity, we believe, is going to carry the day. And we believe that it is necessary that it, over the next decade, We build technology that enables every one of the world's talent. So this could be, you know, an actor, an athlete, a politician to develop a personal relationship with every single one of their supporters or fans. Right. And and 10 years ago, if we had talked about that, that would have been like absolutely impossible. You know, you think about showing up at a um, at a Jay-Z and Beyonce concert and like looking at the 100,000 people in the football stadium and thinking like, wait, in the future, like Jay-Z and Beyonce could have a personal relationship with every single person here and all of their millions of fans around the world. No way. Right. But like now as we're watching, you know, 
products like Cameo, you know, other products going on in the space, you can start to believe that this is going to be possible. And for us, that's the North Star that we're really driving towards. That's a lot of what the internet does. It cuts out the middlemen and women and it cuts out this barrier we've had with our institutions. And frankly, it's sadly breaking them down instead of improving them. But in a way, you're you're slowly but surely getting rid of like talent agencies. Like, do you see, and maybe you disagree that, like, where do you, where do you see this fitting in there? The, you know, really like simplistic answer is yes, right? Like, yes, you know, to get, um, you know, Snoop Dogg to like make a video for some kid's bar mitzvah, pre-cameo, you would have had to track down their agent to go do this. The reality is agencies are great at being Madison Avenue salespeople, right? They are unbelievable at connecting, you know, athletes and actors with brands. They uh, can help negotiate their contracts with a television network or with a sports team or the split with their record label. Like that is what they're great at. They're great at like B2B essentially, right? Like, so the talent to like the the business or brand. For Cameo, like the B2C side of agencies just never has worked. There's a hundred year legacy of, of, you know, William Morris agency, like helping movie stars or Broadway stars like negotiate with their producers. But like, they never figured out how do we like connect the talent with their fans directly because it it was completely impossible pre-Facebook, pre-Twitter, pre-Instagram, you know, uh, pre-TikTok, pre these platforms, pre-YouTube. So in many ways, like the Cameo revenue is not replacing at all, you know, any significant part of the revenue that's coming from talent agencies. It's just literally creating net new opportunities, net new surface area by opening the direct to fan monetization channels up for the first time. All right, you know what an out of the box idea for Mother's Day is? A hello tushy bidet. Yes, Hello Tushy is still a sponsor of Yang Speaks and the bidets are still awesome. It's a great idea for Mother's Day because they're stylish, they're eco-friendly, they're easy to install, they feel great, they cut down on toilet paper costs and they help the environment. So Hello Tushy 3.0 is the champ. It cleans itself. It's got this smart spray automatic self-cleansing nozzle. It is super easy to attach. It cuts your toilet paper use by 80%. Guys, toilet paper adds up. And look, every Hello Tushy bidet attachment comes with a 60-day risk-free guarantee and a 12-month warranty. So get the Hello Tushy 3.0 bidet. Give the gift of a clean butt. Go to hellotushy.com slash yang to get 10% off plus free shipping. Pretty cool, 10% off, free shipping. That's a special order for Yang Speaks listeners at hellotushy.com slash yang for 10% off. So that's hellotushy.com. Dot com slash yang. One of the things that we did with Andrew was um, the concept of product market fit, where it's like, so in the really early days, we're out there trying to make Andrew a politician or like try and I'm taking him to fundraisers and like dragging people to these fundraisers. And it just was like flopping, right? It was just like trying to like, presenting him to the political class and establishment. They're like, who are you? What is? What are you talking about, right? And instead of um, making him appealing to everyone, what we did is we found the people who thought Andrew was appealing, right? Instead of like, we've kind of flipped it where it's like, no, Andrew, you be you and let's find the people that like you and grow it. And so um, I'm curious from your angle and how you're looking at this, where it's like you get on a hit Netflix show, right? Instead of as an actor, let's say for example, or maybe an artist, you do the same thing, but as an actor, you gotta get your next thing quickly to stay relevant, right? But in yours, like, sure, that's helpful, but if someone's awesome on a great TV show, they can start building a fan base through Cameo without their next big thing. Like, ah, like is that the future? Like, what, talk to me what yeah, you think about yeah, the product market so- fit thing. So two, so two things. Number one, um, I love what you talked about of finding the supporter base. And in the same way, right, you can imagine building the Cameo market 
place from scratch. And just like any marketplace, you have the cold start problem, which is, you know, we need to build supply and we need need to build demand. Like imagine the early days of Cameo where we had a platform where we connected fans with their favorite athletes, but we had no athletes and we had no fans on it, right? Like <laughs> where, where do you go yeah. first? Do you get the fans and then tell them, hey, stay tuned. Like eventually we're going to have yeah. people to come here. <laughs> or do you get the athletes and put them on and there's no fans. So they join this thing, they promote and, and they don't waiting. get booked. And it's just like a disaster. We, we had pretty high conviction in our case that the supply side was going to be the critical side of our marketplace. So we spent all of our time you know, early focusing on supply side acquisition. So getting athletes, you know, musicians, reality talent onto the platform. You get and, Brett Favre, then you go out and find as many Packers fans as you well, can. Well, the nice thing is we didn't even really have to do that because Brett Favre has social media, right? And social media, oh, you know, he, he has a million, out. Okay. he can send yeah. a tweet out and he's got a million followers. So all the Packers fans are already following him. So in many ways, like in our marketplace, supply could be get its own demand. On the same time, when we were thinking about the universe of the 5 million people on Earth that we think could be on Cameo, what I came up with early was a framework for the young kids that were working for us or interning us that same summer. I remember drawing a two by two on the whiteboard and the X axis said willingness from like zero willingness uh, so think Marshawn Lynch at the Super Bowl, right? Like he got fined, you know, like $100,000 to not talk at the Super Bowl, which is like every person's dream is like be in the Super Bowl. And he yeah. like refused to answer I'm questions. I'm just serious. I don't get fined, whatever it is. All, yeah. all the way to like me, you know, at the far end, right? Like I'm the founder of Cameo. I am the number one most likely person in the world to like do a Cameo video, right? So that's the X-axis. And then the Y-axis from like me to like Justin Bieber or like LeBron. So yeah, my the mother at the bottom. And yeah, LeBron the Y axis is, right. is fame. So of course we want people in the top right quadrant, super famous, super willing. We didn't want to deal with anyone in the bottom left, not that famous, not that willing. If you get someone, you know, like they're a third string, you know, left guard from the Cleveland Browns and you know, they're no they, offense, they, and people guys. and people no people book <laughs> them and they don't do the they don't do the video. Right. Like that's such a shitty experience that you don't want that. And we made a really controversial decision early, which uh, was ex- is it was contrarian, I would say, even more than controversial. We focused on people in the bottom right, less famous, more willing over the top left, more famous, less willing. For two reasons. Number one, we believe that if Thad Lewis, the former Duke quarterback who, you know, spent seven years as a third string backup quarterback in the NFL, but Play for the charged, Buffalo Bills, love you, Thad. But, but charged five dollars and does all the videos in two seconds, that's such a magical experience. We would rather have him on the platform than Tom Brady at fifty thousand dollars that doesn't ever want to do any, right? So for us, that's what we really focused on was less famous, more willing. That built liquidity. It rigged the customer experience to, to really wow them. And our belief was if you paid fit if you paid five dollars to have a great experience with Dad Lewis in the future, you know, when we got Andre Reed on or we when we got Jim Kelly on, if you're a huge builds fan, you know, for two hundred or five hundred bucks, like you know Cameo's great and you know what to expect, and that'll work. And that's that was a big part for us. You know, in the age of social, 15 minutes of fame can last for 15 years, which is really interesting. So I would argue that the half-life of fame today is increased. So if you have your viral moment, if you have a a Ken Bone moment, right, like the red sweater guy from The Undecided Voter, right? Like that guy's on Cameo and he gets booked today for like 15 minutes of fame because he blew up on Twitter and now he has an audience. And even long past he's, you know, his time of being like in the spotlight on CNN every day, like he now has a network that he can use as distribution for anything else that he's doing because people tend not to unfollow people except for like very extreme grievances. So once you kind of blow up, you are there. So for Cameo, it's not just all the people that are famous now or the, all the famous that will be famous. It's all the people who have ever been famous who can be in that subset of people that can be on the platform. 
it's this interesting concept of, of a platform, of a personal platform. And that is where I think Cameo can start going, where you have these folks that maybe they start a little less famous, but they start building their product market fit and their boot. And then they get a new, like ideally for you, is like you have some like lower list celebrities get booked on a big hit show, booked on a big hit movie, grow their career, and Cameo can ride that wave with them. If you want a graphical representation of where we have product market fit, turn over to the back of a $1 bill, and you know you can picture the pyramid with the eye on top, right? Cameo's product market fit for you is talent. The second that you have your first, like, you know, you get on your first episode of some show or you have your first song, and it continues all the way till the top of the pyramid where you become like the most famous people on earth. Some of the most famous people on earth will continue to stay on Cameo during their reign in the sun. But there's other people that get so famous where, and just so you know, most talent are motivated by three things, money, fame, and love, right? But there are some people who become so famous and they become so beloved and they become so rich that they don't need more fame. They don't need more love. They yeah, just kind of want to be fans. like, they, yeah. they, they kind of want to be left alone. But the thing that's interesting is that this is dynamic. People are constantly moving up and down that pyramid. And there's other people who were the most famous people in the world. And then they're suddenly not anymore, right? You think of, you know, how big Brett Favre or Ray Lewis were. And, you know, they're always going to be legends. They're Hall of Famers or Charlie Sheen, right? Charlie Sheen was the highest paid actor in, in television, you know, for, for a long time. And then, you know, social media, because that 15 minutes of fame can last for 15 years, it gives them a platform where they can go forever. So there's also this, like, this, this, this right edge of the pyramid, which is like your nostalgia point where people like, you know, James Vanderbeek or, you know, someone from like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, like these shows that you loved as a kid, right? Like you might care to hear more about them than uh, Justin Bieber right now because they had some like meaning to you growing up. All right, you know what time it is. <laughs> Here on Yang Speaks, we are always sponsored by Athletic Greens. I freaking love Athletic Greens. I use it all the time. Every day, wake up, open the blue pouch, pour this green powder into half a glass of water, mix it up, and drink it, and it's wonderful. It makes me feel better. I don't eat that well in the pandemic, and this makes me feel like I'm covering all my bases, and that's because one scoop of Athletic Greens, which tastes great, contains 75 vitamins, minerals, Whole food source ingredients, including a multivitamin, multimineral, probiotic, green superfood blend, and more. They all work together to fill nutritional gaps in your diet, increase your energy and focus, which it does. It does increase your energy and focus a bit. And aids with digestion and supports a healthy immune system, all without the need to take multiple products. So here's the deal. Visit athleticgreens.com slash yang and join health experts, athletes, and health conscious go-getters around the world who make a daily commitment to their health every day. Simply visit athleticgreens.com slash yang. Get your free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs today with your first purchase. That is our deal for you. Five free travel packs and a free year supply of vitamin D at athleticgreens.com slash yang. You're growing like a weed. The pandemic accelerated. You're already pretty strong growth, frankly. Um, and you've got, if I get this number, at least over 200 employees working for Cameo, right? And they've been most of them hired in the past couple of years, I'm assuming. Um, but I, I want to say this, and I think you agree. Hiring 200 people in a year is fucking hell. And no one can do it right. And there's no playbook on it. And you're breaking everything. From the outside looking in, it always looks a lot easier, right? Like, you know, you took a survey, you didn't think about Cameo for a couple of years, and then all of a sudden, oh shit, <laughs> you're in CNBC and it's like a billion dollar company. But you know, like the thing, the devil is in the details and finding product market fit is one of like five things that as a CEO, you need to absolutely nail. Um, hiring is interesting. And because I worked at LinkedIn, I think I have like a pretty unique perspective on it. At LinkedIn, we used to pride ourselves on being the best hiring company on earth because we had every resume on earth, right? No other company has every resume. Uh, but even so at LinkedIn, they found that uh, in, in 
on a three year, on a one year basis for an individual contributor employee, one third of people that they hired didn't work out after one year. Right. One third? One third. I know that this is also the case at companies like Amazon, where at Amazon, uh, they give, they find that I think it's 72% of the people that, um, that they extend a internship, like a, a pre uh, graduation internship for, that they'll give a full time offer. So somewhere between 25% and a third of the people that you hire, even if you're best in class, right? And you're LinkedIn, you're, you're Amazon, you're Apple, you're Microsoft, these are Hall of Fame companies, right? Like you are gonna screw up hiring somewhere between 25% and a third of the time. And you just have to be okay with that. And, the, and it's interesting, I just did an interview on CNBC talking about this. I don't think it's inherently, a lot of people say, oh, making mistakes is great. It's like inherently, I don't think making mistakes is inherently valuable at all. But what I think is valuable is to quickly address the mistakes that you made. So, so one of the things that we do at Cameo that's really interesting is we've rolled out something called the MVP performance process. And while we negotiate somebody's, uh, like if you're gonna come work for me and actually be on the executive team, like it's customary in startups to negotiate equity and to negotiate cash and you know different things like that. But I actually make them negotiate their A plus 20, you know, their A plus one year performance review. So if you were gonna come work for me, I would say, Zach, you and I are gonna take a Google our Google spreadsheet or Google doc, and we are gonna write out what does your A plus, if you come work for me and we're doing this, this we're, we're, we're having a annual review on April 8th of 2022, what did you accomplish this year? What does A plus look like? And we will go back and forth, we'll redline this thing. And when we get it in a place that we're both, we're both excited about, we then use that as the benchmark for how your performance is actually happening in the company. So at 90 days, we'll take a look at this and we'll say, hey Zach, here was that A plus performance review that we agreed upon when you came in to, to come take this job. Um, you know what? I actually think you're surpassing it. Great fucking job. You know, give you like give you uh, you know a smack, you know, a smack and, and tell five. you like yeah. high five, keep going, right? <laughs> yeah. On the flip side, if you're like if you're like 15% below, if you're like at plan to like 15% below plan. Hey, Zach, you're doing a great job, but like there's a couple little things that I think you can fix to get you back on that A plus path. Right now, I think you're on an A minus path or an A path, but I, I want you to be an all star here. I want you to be a Hall of Fame player. Here's what I need you to fix. Sometimes people are 15 to 30 percent off. Right. And at that point, you're like, hey, you know what, Zach, like I'm going to really need you to see you know some improvement here. Otherwise, like. I think we're gonna fall short. I just don't have confidence that we're gonna make it. And then there's other people and you've hired them on the campaign where you know you know, like by lunchtime the first day that like they are not the right fit, right? They're, they're more than 30% off the mark. Those are the people you just gotta fire immediately and just say, hey, you know what, Zach, thank you so much for taking a shot on the campaign. Um, this isn't gonna work out. I don't think this is the best fit for us. This is the best fit for you. We're dedicated to helping you find a place where you can be more successful, uh, but you know we're gonna have to part ways. And being maniacal about that and being okay with making mistakes because look, it's, it's there. And the other thing I'll mention too, like we take a lot of pride in the culture that we built at Cameo. And, you know, we've been, our culture has become, you know, famous, you know, we've won all types of awards for the culture that we have. But I believe that culture doesn't get set top down. It doesn't come from you and Andrew. It actually, culture is, happens at a very local basis, right? If one individual team hires an asshole on it, the 10 people that work with them every day, their work just sucks more for them than it did before. The culture before. becomes like hating the asshole. So, so ultimately, I believe that culture changes every time that you hire somebody. It either gets better or it gets worse. And this is where, you know, you have to look at your mission, your vision, and your core values and really be maniacal about, hey, here's this person that we just brought in. Are they going to help us achieve and manifest our long-term vision and mission? And if not, you got to swap them out and find somebody else that can. Our biggest blue chip companies do not get this right. 
So it's ridiculous to think like startups or campaigns are gonna get it right. No, no, <laughs> nobody nails it, right? And another thing too that I've seen in my career, right? There are people that have done exceptional work in the past. People I knew from you know college, people I knew from working at other companies with them. That sometimes they come when they're working with you. It might not be the best point of their life. Like they might be going through things at home. They might may have health issues, right? We're, we're human. So it's, it's about like, how do you find people that are doing the best work of their career? And my exec, my executive coach is a guy named Bing Gordon and Bing, um, when we were, when we were talking about last year, like I, I went through rebuilding my entire executive team during a global pandemic, as we decided to move to a fully distributed company. Right. So prior to that, Cameo was headquartered in Chicago. Most of the executive team was in Chicago. We had a couple sprinkled in L.A. And we then decided to get rid of our offices, have a national search for CFO, for COO, for CTO, for chief people officer. And we said, we don't care where you live. We just want to get the best people no matter where you are. And 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 as we were going through this process, I asked Bing, I said, Bing, when you've been around great executive teams at Amazon, at Zynga, at Electronic Arts, you know, at countless companies, like what what causes teams to really gel and become Hall of Fame? And he had this story about uh, Ray Bork, the famous hockey player from longtime Boston Bruin. Ray Bork played, I think, 19 years from the Bruins, never won a Stanley Cup. Halfway through his last season, they traded him uh, to the Colorado Avalanche and he won the Stanley Cup in game seven, like on his last game. And and Bing said, he's like, I ran into Ray Bork on the golf course and, and, and I asked him, Ray, what did it take to win the Stanley Cup? And he goes, you know, you need uh, a couple sat grizzled old vets that still have a blue burning flame. So they've had a whole thing careers, but they still like are hungry for to lift the Stanley Cup one more time or or maybe they never they've had a Hall of Fame career and they've never won. But like this just gives them that blue burning flame that they've accomplished everything, but they like need to do this. And you kind of need that veteran leadership. You then need like, uh, you know, a few otherworldly rookies, people that are young, like so talented, but young, dumb and stupid and like don't even know what they're up against. And I kind of think like of the Chicago Blackhawks, you know, uh, you know, during the dynasty, like Patrick Kane, you know, Jonathan Taylor, like these guys are 19, 20 years old and they're just like in their kits. Right. And they're just so good. And then he's like, then you need, you know, two lines of you know, A players that have, are about to do the best work of their lives, right? And he's like, that's the formula for building a Hall of Fame team. And I think it's the same on campaigns, right? I actually think in many ways, a political campaign that gets traction is the closest thing in the world to a venture scale startup, right? We just ingested a hundred million dollars and all of a sudden like, you know, now it's like, all right, we're, how do we grow this thing? Not just in the U.S., but like, how do we make this work in Japan and Brazil and all over the world? And like, in time is money. That money's in the bank and the clock is starting just like for a campaign. You know, you guys have a huge fundraising quarter. You have to scale up operations. And it is like, you know, guns blazing. The difference is on a campaign, eventually it just ends, right? It's election oh, yeah, day. Oh, yeah, it's running into a wall. It's like and you building an wall Amazon and, just, and shutting it down. And shutting it down. Where for us, when you're in that blitzscaling mode, you have to make sure that you build a culture that can sustain. And, you know, and it's still a place five years from now that people want to come and work every day because they love the vision, the mission, and the team that you've built around them. And I'll say this, like it is um, the challenges of hiring people fast and building something on the fly and the combination of inexperience and veterans and building, bringing, building a team and stuff. That's not an excuse for screwing up. Like we, you know, like we made a ton of mistakes um, and some I like personally like regret. So that's not an excuse to screw up. Like, you know, like, I, like there's still responsibility to be had. You still have to build a good culture despite, despite the odds stacked against. You still have to hire great people. And like, even though it's like in many ways, like, you're, you're shooting in the dark. It's like a, it's a bit of a luck game. And look, the other day, like, there's, this is not a boo-hoo conversation. Like, the, the reality is we knew this too. Like, Andrew and I, like, this is the NFL, or to keep a sports analogy. This is the most competitive environment in the world. Like, you're in a startup world. Like, you're trailblazing. It's the most competitive environment in the world. Politics, same thing. Maybe more so because it's so public. Um, and 
You're gonna make mistakes. You're gonna make awesome decisions. You roll with them. You learn from them. You go. Well, even even to the NFL analogy, right? Uh, NFL is a 52 man roster, 53 man roster, and I think training camp starts somewhere like you know they get about 80 people on the training camp roster too. So it's also that same like you know 20 to you know 33 percent of people that aren't working out, and you know you're you're having this trial by fire, and there is no room on an NFL team for the people that aren't going to help you win games in the future, right? So just because you did great work before. Are you going to be able to, you know, help win the next Super Bowl? Like that's what you're optimizing for. And in both, you know, political campaigns and startups, I think it's the same, right? It's like you you need people that have been there, done that, but you, you should also be hiring for ceiling versus resume. Right. Um, and if you have a longer term timeline, which I know you guys do, then you can. You can have people grow into roles. One of the hardest parts of campaigns, like, hey, you know, you, you got three months here. You can't grow on the job. You don't know how to do it. You don't. What's Future cameo, future this, but also like kind of the future of the marketplace too. Where, where do you see this going? We're really excited about the vision of the company, which is in the future, like we want to create technology which enables every talent to have a personalized relationship, a personal relationship with every single one of their supporters or fans. Uh, that's really exciting. I think it opens up a host of new formats for us, not just the personalized video message, which you know we become famous for, but uh, things like our new fan club offering, uh, things like Cameo Calls, which is synchronous video chats, uh, things like Cameo Direct or, or DMing product. So there's, there's a whole ecosystem of things that are around us, and it's all about uh, you know, how do we help people build better relationships at the end of the day? So I think that's thing number one. Thing number two, 26% of our traffic comes from abroad already. And we haven't even really started trying uh, to grow the business outside of the English speaking world. So we have people in London and the UK today. But, you know, how big could this be in Korea with K-pop or in Japan or in Brazil or in, you know, Western Europe? you know, all over the world. Like I, I'm Greek and my parents, my mom and her friends are like, why isn't this Greek singer on the platform? It's not that we couldn't get them. It's just such a big world that we haven't focused on that. And now this next phase for us is like, how do we, even before thinking about creating new verticals, how do we just continue to go more horizontal and, and go from the 40,000 people we have today to the 5 million people globally that we think could be on this uh, as quickly as possible. So that's that's kind of what's next. Well, I think that's exciting. It's also talking about like democratizing entertainment and fame and, and talent in a certain way. It's like, I love, I love that show Lupin on, uh, on Netflix or Lupin if we want to Americanize it, but it's like an American, it's a heist movie, uh, but it's in French. Be, bring French entertainment to the United States and UK entertainment and Japanese entertainment. This is becoming an international landscape instead of just an American landscape. And I hope, frankly, I'm excited to see Cameo play a front and center role in that. So look, man, uh, congratulations on building this. Entrepreneurship, I use the bamboo analogies. Like bamboo takes like two years to grow like six inches. And then it's like two weeks to grow 10 feet, like the rest of it. So uh, congratulations. I hope you get a little, uh, get to smile and, and enjoy the ride. Um, and from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your time, Steve. Thanks, Zach. And as I said earlier, and I mean this sincerely, this is a necessary step to building a Hall of Fame company. And, you know, I believe we're in the top of the second inning here and there is a hell of a lot more work to do. It's very similar to a political campaign where when you win office, right, then now you the hard work starts and you have to govern (laughs) and you want to leave the city a better place. So. Uh, we'll be cheering for for you guys from the sideline as well. And, um, you know, pumped to watch what happens this year. Well, thank you, man. Let's do it. 